Hey there, you Welcome back to my channel. Today we're back to continue the read aloud read along of Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. We've been reading together chapters of this book and previous videos have been linked in the playlist. It's in the description box down below. So if you're new to the series and you'd like to start with chapter one, go ahead, click the playlist and you can start there. Otherwise, today we're going to continue with chapter 28, which in this edition of the book starts on page 229. I apologize if I sound a little congested or look a little different. <laughs> I've been getting over a little cold and so my voice is not the same as it used to be but hopefully it will get better but we're gonna read together hopefully it's not too much of a distraction for you this is chapter 28 although my grades were very good I had been put up two semesters on my arrival from stamps I found myself unable to settle down in the high school it was an institution for girls near my house and the young ladies were faster brasher meaner and more prejudiced than any I had met at Lafayette County training school Many of the Negro girls were, like me, straight from the South, but they had known or claimed to have known the bright lights of Big D, Dallas, or T-Town, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and their language bore up their claims. They strutted with an aura of invincibility, and along with some of the Mexican students who put knives in their tall pompadours, they absolutely intimidated the white girls and those black and Mexican students who had no shield of fearlessness. Fortunately, I was transferred to George Washington High School. The beautiful buildings sat on a moderate hill in the white residential district, some 60 blocks from the Negro neighborhood. For the first semester, I was one of three black students in the school. And in that rarefied atmosphere, I came to love my people more. Mornings as the streetcar traversed my ghetto, I experienced a mixture of dread and trauma. I knew that all too soon we'd be out of my familiar setting and blacks who were on the streetcar when I got on would all be gone and I alone would face the 40 blocks of neat streets, smooth lawns, white houses and rich children. In the evenings on the way home, the sensations were joy, anticipation and relief at the first sign which said barbecue or do drop in or home cooking or at the first brown faces on the street. I recognized that I was again in my country. In the school itself, I was disappointed to find that I was not the most brilliant or even nearly the most brilliant student. The white kids had better vocabularies than I and what was more appalling, less fear in the classrooms. They never hesitated to hold up their hands in response to a teacher's question. Even when they were wrong, they were wrong aggressively. While I had to be certain about all my facts before I dared to call attention to myself. George Washington High School was the first real school I attended. My entire stay there might have been time lost if it hadn't been for the unique personality of a brilliant teacher. Miss Kerwin was that rare educator who was in love with information. I will always believe that her love of teaching came not so much from her liking for students, but from her desire to make sure that some of the things she knew would find repositories so that they could be shared again. She and her maiden sister worked in the San Francisco city school system for over 20 years. My Miss Kerwin, who was a tall, florid, buxom lady with battleship gray hair, taught civics and current events. At the end of a term in her class, our books were as clean and the pages as stiff as they had been when they were issued to us. Miss Kerwin's students were never or very rarely called upon to open textbooks. She greeted each class with, Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I had never heard an adult speak with such respect to teenagers. Adults usually believe that a show of honor diminishes their authority. In today's Chronicle, there was an article on the mining industry in the Carolinas, or some such distant subject. I am certain that all of you have read the article. I would like someone to elaborate on the subject for me. After the first two weeks in her class, I, along with all the other excited students, read the San Francisco papers, Time Magazine, Life, and everything else available to me. Miss Kerwin proved Bailey right. He had told me once that all knowledge is a spendable currency, depending on the market. There were no favorite students, no teacher's pets. If a student pleased her during a particular period, he could not count on special treatment in the next day's class, and that was as true the other way around. Each day, she faced us with a clean slate and acted as if ours were clean as well. Reserved and firm in her opinions, she spent no time in indulging the frivolous. She was stimulating instead of intimidating. Where some of the other teachers went out of their way to be nice to me, to be a liberal with me, and others ignored me completely, Miss Carwin never seemed to notice that I was black and therefore different. I was Miss Johnson, 
And if I had the answer to a question she posed, I was never given any more than the word correct, which was what she said to every other student with the correct answer. Years later, when I returned to San Francisco, I made visits to her classroom. She always remembered that I was Miss Johnson, who had a good mind and should be doing something with it. I was never encouraged on those visits to loiter or linger about her desk. She acted as if I must have had other visits to make. I often wondered if she knew she was the only teacher I remembered. I never knew why I was given a scholarship to the California Labor School. It was a college for adults and many years later I found that it was on the House on american Activities list of subversive organizations. At 14, I accepted a scholarship and got one for the next year as well. In the evening classes, I took drama and dance along with white and black grown-ups. I had chosen drama simply because I liked Hamlet's soliloquy beginning, to be or not to be. I had never seen a play and did not connect movies with the theater. In fact, the only times I had heard the soliloquy had been when I had melodramatically recited to myself in front of a mirror. It was hard to curb my love for the exaggerated gesture and the emotive voice. When Bailey and I read poems together, he sounded like a fierce Basil Rathbone and I like a maddened Beth Davis. At the California Labor School, a forceful and perceptive teacher quickly and unceremoniously separated me from melodrama. She made me do six months of pantomime. Bailey and mother encouraged me to take dance and he privately told me that the exercise would make my legs big and widen my hips. I needed no greater inducement. My shyness at moving clad in black tights around a large empty room did not last long. Of course, at first I thought everyone would be staring at my cucumber shaped body with its knobs for knees, knobs for elbows and alas, knobs for breasts. But they really did not notice me, and when the teacher floated across the floor and finished in an arabesque, my fancy was taken. I would learn to move like that. I would learn to, in her words, occupy space. My days angled off Miss Kerwin's class, dinner with Bailey and mother, and drama and dance. The allegiances I owed at this time in my life would have made very strange bedfellows. Mama, with her solemn determination, Mrs. Flowers and her books, Bailey with his love, my mother and her gaiety, Miss Kerwin and her information, my evening classes of drama and dance. And that's chapter 28. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And let's talk in the comments. I'd love to hear from you how you're enjoying this book and what you think is gonna happen in the last few chapters of Maya Angelou's first memoir. So let's talk in the comments. Thanks for being here. And until next time, happy reading. Bye.